Coming in at number 10, we have the treasure of Lima. Back when the Spanish had colonized most of Central and South America, they were going to great lengths to collect all the treasures they could find. They wanted to make one of the largest collections of wealth the world has ever seen, and they managed to put together a pretty good pile until revolutions started popping up all over the place. The island of Lima held a massive treasure, and to save it from falling into the hands of the people who were revolting, the Spanish government made a plan to move all the goods to Mexico. This shipment of goods contained several gold statues, rare jewels, tools and metals, and even just straight up cash. Now here's where things get murky. Some people say that the treasure made its way to Mexico. Other people say the treasure was hijacked by William Thomas and his men took the treasure to Cocos Island, but they were arrested and executed before they could come back to claim it. Others say the Mexicans struck a deal with Thomas and now the treasure is hidden. Another type of boogeyman is coming in at number nine. This one is less about the hair and more about the drinking the blood of children. So swings and roundabouts really. Right? That's right, we have the Legend of El Cuco. It is thought that this particular Mexican myth was brought over from Spain in the colonial era. El Cuco in life was a man suffering with tuberculosis, the disease that oft Santine in Moulin Rouge, and honestly, I'm never gonna get over that. Tuberculosis basically was a huge killer. These days, it actually still is an issue in Mexico, however, it is curable, thank goodness. In the era of El Cuco, though, a cure was a long way off. The legend goes that El Cuco met with a curandero, a traditional healer. She told the man that the only way to cure the disease was to drink the blood of a child and then rub their fat on his chest. Gnarly. So diligently, El Cuco did this, having no qualms about kidnapping and murdering a seven year old boy. What a savage. These days, El Cuco is said to roam the streets looking for misbehaving children to kill to cure his ailments. A modern day myth coming in at number eight, we have El Chubacabra is a classic cryptid. A chubacabra is a legendary creature in folklore, a blood sucking animal vampire hybrid. Its name literally translates to goat sucker. Now the legend of El Chubacara is most popular in Puerto Rico, northern Mexico and the border states of the USA. It became most prevalent however in modern times. In 1996, following an incident in Puerto Rico, the chubacabra allegedly began killing goats in the Mexican countryside. Now I found a mid 90s article on CNN which quote a Mexican woman. She said, It's horrible because we don't know what it is. I don't think it's a coyote or a dog, like officials say, because a dog can't kill 10 goats with a single blow. To this day, some 25 years later, people still believe that a vampire goat sucker was behind the killings. Often, stray hairless dogs in Mexico are mistaken as the chubacabra, which adds fuel to the myth's fire. Coming into number seven, we have the owls. Roll after roll of gibberish, and all of a sudden, the owls are not what they seem. Oh, I love a good owl. I really do. I love how evil they look. And like, you're not gonna be messing with no owl, are you? Not in Mexico, anyway. La Lechuza is a woman by day and an owl by night. There are a lot of strands to the myth, but it is generally agreed upon that the woman has been wronged in some way and is looking to seek revenge. Some say that the Lechuza snatches children in her talons because her own child was killed by angry villagers for a crime that they did not commit. Others say that her child was killed by a drunkard and so now the shape-shifting owl exacts revenge by perching on the rooftops of bars waiting until closing time to attack drinkers stumbling out into the night. Others think that the owl is simply a familiar of a witch. Either way, the owls are bad news bears. There have been gigantic bird sightings happening over northern Mexico, especially in Chihuahua and Tamaulipas and the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. These have been going on for centuries and a lot of people think that it is the La Lechuza looking for revenge. In general, Mexicans are traditionally distrusting of owls. Coming in at number six, we have La Lorna. This is actually a very sad and enduring Mexican myth and legend. La Lorna is a wailing ghost that is said to bring misfortune or even death if you hear her cries, rather like the banshee in Irish folklore. The story behind the legend is one of a woman named Maria who is raised in a small rural village. Quite the beauty, she piqued the attention of a passing nobleman who married her and whisked her away away from her family to a house outside of the village where she had two children. Unfortunately for her though, her husband would travel a lot and when he returned he seemed changed, only to care about their sons and seemingly was disinterested in her. 
One day, he returned with another woman, which drove Maria to insanity, which I totally get. Like, get her out. Her husband bid farewell to his sons and ignored his wife, leaving with the other woman. Maria, in utter despair, threw her two children in a river. Upon realizing what she'd done, she tried to save them, but they'd been swept away and drowned. She then killed herself and pleaded at the gates of heaven to be reunited with her sons, but the gatekeepers told her that she must find them first. She now is stuck in purgatory as a ghost always looking for her children. It is said that if she finds lost children at night, she drowns them, hoping they contain the souls of her lost sons. If you hear wailing or crying near a body of water at night, you are to run in the opposite direction for fear of being drowned or meeting the bad luck associated with La Lorna. Coming into number 5, we have El Moto, the Headless Bandit. The El Morto tale is truly terrifying. I mean, what isn't to be afraid of? It comes in the form of a headless ghost, which, ah. This myth, or we hope myth anyway, actually comes from the US border with Mexico, dating back to the Gold Rush era. Now, a lot of people were looking around the border regions for gold. On top of that, the US Mexico border was hotly contested around that time, with an area of no man's land between the two countries. In this area, Bandits were rife, and Texas Rangers were around to keep them in check because America. One Ranger, William Bigfoot Wallace, wanted to teach the bandits a lesson after one persistent criminal, known simply as Vidal, stole a bunch of Mustang horses. When he was caught, Bigfoot Wallace and his Ranger friends chopped off Vidal's head, sat his body on a horse, attached his hands to the reins, and strung his head to the saddle. Crikey. This was supposed to teach the would be bandits a lesson not to mess with the Texans, but some poor sod had to deal with finding the horse and its deceased cargo too, which is like a double blow. Despite eventually being taken down from the horse, legend has it that Mexican Vidal rides through the valley of Rio Grande today, with his ghost being dubbed El Morto, scaring Americans everywhere they are. Like, nay, ah. Coming in at number four, we have the legend of the crystal skulls. Ah, crystal skulls, it truly is a great Mexican mystery. I also love starting things with ah, don't I? Like, ah. Many curious crystal skulls have been found across ruin and burial sites in Mexico, sparking intrigue. There is a myth about the skulls that seems to say that after the 13th has been discovered, mankind will unlock the secrets of the earth and begin a new age. Now, this date was predicted by the Mayans to be in 2012, but we haven't got there yet. Better get looking for more skulls. Myth aside, the skulls are still an enigma due to their intricate crystal work, which would have been exceptionally complex and intricate for the time in which they were created. Coming into number 3, we have the Eclipse. Pregnant mamas, watch out. In Mexican folklore, it is said that if a pregnant woman is exposed outdoors during a solar eclipse, her baby will be born with a cleft lip or cleft palate, which is pretty bizarre. So like, why though? Well, it seems that the belief dates back to the Aztec eras when the best explanation for an eclipse was that a bite had been taken from the moon, possibly by some kind of wolf god. For them, it made sense that if a bite could be taken from the moon, a bite could be taken from an unborn child in a womb should the mother view the eclipse anyway. So to protect her, she would have an obsidian knife placed on her belly before she went out. Now these days the tradition and beliefs are upheld and a woman tends to take a metal key or safety pin out for protection at night in the event of an eclipse. But honestly, let's be like totally fair, eclipses are pretty rare, they don't happen that often so I wouldn't be too worried, she says. Coming into number 2, we have the Day of the Dead. Mexicans kind of have a macabre humour when it comes to death, and I can get on board with that, I truly can. Death is coming for us anyway, so we may as well dress it up in a floral hat and have a good time playing with it, right? Rather than fearing for it all of our lives. Party with death? Anyone? Is anyone watching from Mexico? Because like, hello, tell me more about this. The Day of the Dead is a big party in Mexico. It centers on La Calvera Catrina, a female skeleton wearing a fancy hat that's basically the personification of death. She stems back to the Aztec mythology of the Queen of Mictlan, who keeps watch over the bones of the dead and presides over festivals celebrating the afterlife. Traditionally, Mexicans believe that a person has to get through nine challenges to reach the afterlife, and family members will provide them with food and water throughout this difficult journey. On the Day of the Dead, it is believed that the barrier between the spirit world and the real world dissolves. During this time, the souls of the dead awaken and return to the living world to feast and drink and dance and play music with their loved ones. I actually really kind of love that. It's kind of like a fun day of remembrance without crying and, you know, tequila and sombreros. Okay, we have a crazy and enduring story to end off this list at number one. We have The Tale of the Travelling Soldier. 
soldier. The transported soldier legend has it that in 1593, a soldier from the Philippines transported from Manila straight to Mexico City in their sleep. What? Gil Perez was said to have nodded off as he leaned against the governor's palace wall on October 24th, 1593. Now, if that date rings a bell, you're about to hear why. You can't blame him for nodding off. He had a very long night because the governor had just been assassinated. He was standing guard as a new leader was being appointed, and he drifted off. As he slept, though, curiously, he woke up in Mexico City. And I'm not sure if you've looked at a map recently, but that is very, 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 very very far away, like other side of the world away. Perez was questioned by officials in Mexico who found him. They threw him in jail after he told them that he'd simply just woken up thousands of miles from where he was supposed to be. Suspicious, honestly, I, I get it. Eventually, when a passenger ship from Manila turned up in Mexico City months later, crews were able to confirm Perez's story about the governor's assassination and the soldier's disappearance. So, like, WTF, like teleportation, alien abduction, or just good old fashioned myth. Starting off at number 10 now, we have La Llorona. The story goes like this. Once upon a time, in a Mexican village, there lived a young woman called Maria. Her family was poor, but she was known for her beauty. One day, a rich nobleman was travelling through her village, but stopped in his tracks when he saw Maria. He was so charmed by her beauty that he proposed to her immediately. She accepted, the wedding was planned, even though the nobleman's father was disappointed that his son was marrying into poverty. Maria and her new husband built a house in the village, and eventually she gave birth to two twin boys. Her husband was always travelling, but returned when he could, until one day, he never came home. A while later, as Maria and her boys were walking by a river, she saw a familiar carriage with a younger, beautiful woman next to her husband. Maria flew into a jealous rage. She was so angry at seeing her husband cheating on her, that she picked up her two boys and flung them into the river. By the time she came around, their bodies were floating in the river, face down. She then jumped in, hoping to also drown and be with her kids. Now, they say her soul is attached to the land, unable to pass on because of her grief and the murder of her two little boys. People say if you hear her cries, then misfortune or even death is just around the corner. If you're a child, you must be extra careful. She is always attracted to children, hoping they are actually hers. She will try and drown them to be with her children. Kids must never walk alone by the river unless they too want to meet the same fate. Coming in at number nine, we have the Crystal Skulls. One of the strangest artifacts that has ever been uncovered in Mexico are the Crystal Skulls. They are extremely rare and well crafted, and they could have just been pieces of art that were commonly traded for goods back in the 7th and 8th century. This was when the Mayans were a prominent civilization in Mexico. Now, the mystery behind these skulls mixes into a few different areas. First, no one really knows who made them. They are so rare and they are so dispersed. Some of them are even being found in southern countries like Belize. It's unclear how many people had the skill to make such a piece. Also, there is a mystical element to this. There is a legend that says once all 13 skulls are found, it will bring the end end of the world, so I guess we should probably stop looking for these things. Coming in at number 8, we have the Dead Zone. Yeah, anything that catches that nickname can't bring something happy. You don't call a place the Dead Zone because it's full of candy and sunshine, unless you're trying to lure kids in there so you can eat them. The Dead Zone is an area in the state of Durango. For whatever reason, it's almost impossible to get any sort of radio waves to pass through this area. If you get lost in there, you might be stuck in this desert until the blazing heat takes you to a dehydrated grave. Now, this has baffled scientists for years, and recently it has been chalked up to an electromagnetic disturbance. But there hasn't been enough research to verify this. Also, many people have made claims of seeing extraterrestrials in the area. Coming in at number 7, we have the death of Mario Amato. This is a wild case with a series of twists and turns. It starts off with two couples heading down from California to Mexico for a nice getaway. The year was 1992. The couples consisted of Mario and his girlfriend Paula, and his brother Joe and his girlfriend Debbie. They all arrived in Mexico at a condo in Rosario. Rito Beach. The couples would be staying there for the weekend. The first night ended with Mario and Paula getting into a vicious argument, which eventually cooled down. The next day, Joe and Debbie were out, and Paula and Mario got into it again, and this time Mario was arrested. When Joe and Debbie came back to the house, no one was there, and Paula arrived later, but Mario was still missing. It was not long after this that the police arrived and told the three of them that Mario was dead. He had hung himself in jail. This was very suspicious, and after an autopsy, it would seem that Mario had a serious injury to his liver before he was hung, and there was a lot of evidence showing that he was murdered, but the police closed the investigation and called it a suicide. 
Coming in at number six, we have where are the Aztec rulers? When you go back through time, you can find a lot of the burial sites of ancient rulers. If you go snooping around a pyramid, you might find a sarcophagus that has some old dude who's mummified and he's stuck in there. But the thing with the Aztec rulers is that none of them have been found. Now this could be for a few reasons. Some people speculate that the Aztecs used to burn their leaders and spread their ashes after they died. But there could be a chance that the remains were kept somewhere sacred and we haven't discovered it yet. Coming in at number five, we have the Mexican Mothman. A little over a decade ago, there were some very strange reports coming from the town of Legenta, Mexico. People had claimed that they saw a massive winged creature that looked as if it might have been part human. People from all over the city were saying that something that was around 9 feet tall, covered head to toe in hair, and had a massive wingspan was flying over people and following them. The explanation for these sightings has never been solved. This could have been a hoax put together by some local kids who were trying to freak people out, or did Mothman actually work his way down to Mexico? go for a little visit. Coming in at number four, we have the Island of Dolls. One of the creepiest things that I have ever seen. The Island of Dolls is a famous tourist attraction that is deep in the jungle close to Mexico City. The former owner of this island found the body of a dead girl who had drowned in a river close by, along with her doll that was floating next to her. He took the doll and hung it up to appease the spirit of the girl. For the next few years, he hung up more dolls to keep the girl's ghost happy, until one day when the man was found dead. He drowned in the exact same spot as the girl. No one knows how he died in that exact spot. Coming in at number three, we have Gordon Collins. Another story of couples heading down to Mexico for a little trip. Maybe you should go in groups of three and then you'll be fine. Gordon, his girlfriend, and his two friends went down to Mexico for a vacation. They were supposed to stay there for a week. One day they rented a boat and they went out to do some fishing, but a huge storm hit and three of their bodies were found dead in the water. It was thought that Gordon was also dead from the storm until a few days later when he was seen walking around the fishing village. His parents Parents came down to find him, but after following a trail of sightings, he was nowhere to be found. Then he popped up in Cabo San Lucas. His parents chased him down again, and once again, he was nowhere to be found. After this, 70 sightings of him were reported, but he was never found by anyone looking for him. It's thought that he might have been suffering from amnesia. Coming in at number two, we have Meha Island. How can you make a whole island disappear. Well, it seems like somehow someone did this. The Meha Island was apparently an island just off the coast of the Yucatan in the Atlantic Ocean. There are documents recording the location of this island that date back over 400 years, but in the 1970s, it would seem that the island existed no more. The location of where the island apparently was is now just an open area of ocean. Not even like the island sunk below sea level because of rising water levels. No, there's no trace of this island ever being in the area. There are rumors that the United States states destroyed the island so they could travel through the area without breaking international charter laws, but if they did this, how did they do it? And coming in at the number one spot, we have Chichen Itza. This is one of the most famous structures in the world. Built by the ancient Mayan civilization, it stands as one of the wonders that will blow anyone's mind. This is a similar mystery akin to the pyramids. There are rooms inside Chichen Itza that are built so perfectly that you can hear into other rooms, and it's said high-ranking officials would wait in these rooms and eavesdrop on conversations so they could seem like they had godly knowledge. There's also a point at the front of the pyramid that produces an amazing echo response. When you clap at the front of this point, it sends out a noise that can be heard a kilometer in every direction. It's these amazing feats of ingenuity that make people wonder how did they build it? I know a lot of you people think that aliens built the pyramids, and I know you guys know that I love conspiracy theories, but I'm going to go on a different angle. The mystery is what technology did they have? Everything they built was so precise, we still have no idea how they did it. There are points in Chichen Itza that are lined up perfectly with the points of north, south, east, and west. So the question stands. How did they do it? All right, coming in at number 10, we have El Sombaron. What is a myth or a legend video without the boogeyman? Nothing, that's what. El Sombaron is a baffling one, really. He's like a lusty boogeyman with a weird hair obsession. Bald? No worries. Luscious locks? Watch out. El Sombaron is said to wear a big black hat that covers the majority of his face. He's a short man with big eyes that poke out from behind a silver guitar that he'll use to serenade ladies with. You'll know when he's been around as you may find horses with curiously braided tails or a plait in a girl's hair that she doesn't remember placing herself. One tale says that he stood outside on the balcony of a beautiful woman with long hair. On hearing his music, she became mesmerized by him. He returned to her balcony night after night to the point where the girl actually stopped eating and sleeping. Her parents were worried about her, so they cut off her hair, which immediately made El Sombron lose interest. So gutted, although honestly, probably for the best, a gal needs 
some dinner. If I had to choose between luscious hair and having a good taco, like, give me the food. Moving on to number nine now, we have El Sombreron. In some parts of Mexico, people swear this mysterious creature exists. Its name roughly translates to the goblin in English. He goes around wearing a huge dark hat and dresses entirely in black except for his ornamental boots and belt. He preys on the young, especially girls. El Sombreron has an obsession with braiding hair. He often braids the manes and tails of horses, or if there are none about, he braids the hair of dogs. People see the animals with their hair braided like this, they know the goblin is somewhere nearby. When he can't find the animals, he follows young women with large eyes and long hair. He arrives in town with a pack of mules, and when he finds a woman that he likes, he ties up his mules and serenades her with a silver guitar. After enchanting her back to his home, he said to serve them dirt for dinner, which makes them unable to sleep. The legend goes that a young girl named Susanna was admiring the moon and stars from her balcony one night when she was approached and serenaded by the goblin with the big hat. Her parents were worried and upset by their daughter being out so late, and so they forced her to come inside. The goblin returned every night though, making it impossible for her to sleep. When her parents tried to feed her, she'd always find dirt in her food. Her parents eventually cut the girl's hair and had it blessed by a priest. Suddenly, the Earl Sombreron had no interest in her, and the visits just stopped. He moved on to search for his next victim, and they say he continues his journey even today. Moving on to number 8 now, we have the Vanishing Hitchhiker. This is an old story burned into the memory of many Mexicans. One night in November, many years ago, a taxi driver called Pedro Ramirez was heading for the town of Cazones. It was a warm night, but every now and again, Pedro felt a quick snap of cold. Then, on the dark road, a girl stopped him to ask for help. She said that bad people wanted to harm her, and so they sped away from the area together. She said her name was Martha, and that her parents were the owners of the ranch where he had just picked her up from. He took her to Cazones and left her at the house that she wanted to go to. Martha was very grateful, and invited him to spend the day with her some time. Pedro took her up on this offer, and returned a few days later. He knocked on the door of the house, an elderly woman came to the door, he asked for Martha, and explained how they met. The old woman smiled, and said that Martha was her daughter, who had been assassinated 10 years before by drug dealers outside of her husband's ranch. The woman was smiling because this wasn't the first time Martha's ghost had done this. Still, Pedro didn't quite believe her. She invited him in, and there in the living room was a very old photo of Martha, looking just like she had the other night. Many people get creeped out by this story, but are also quite glad to know who the girl is by the side of the road to Cazones. Next up at number 7 now, we have the Santa Paula Cemetery. This is said to be a very haunted cemetery near the city of Guadalajara. The story dates back to 1882 and goes like this. One night, a young couple put their nine-year-old son, Ignacio, to bed. His family nickname was Nachito. Nachito slept with a light on as he was very afraid of the dark. He had two lit torches outside of his bedroom window and slept with the windows open. This particular night, a storm hit and blew out the torches. The next morning, his mother entered the room to find it was icy cold. She rushed to Nachito but found him dead. He had died from a heart attack due to his pathological fear of the dark when the torches went out. However, a rumor spread that Nachito's heart had actually exploded inside his chest, and that his death was actually a curse, or the work of demons. He was laid to rest in a cemetery, and the strangeness that began with his death did not end quickly. The next morning, his coffin was found lying on the ground next to his grave. The parents and locals were shocked and had it reburied, but the next morning, the same exact thing happened. It continued like this for nine straight days. His parents began to think that the boy was so afraid of the dark, he didn't want to be kept in the ground away from the light, even in death. So, they created a stone coffin that stood on pillars above the ground, so that his tomb could always see sunlight. Ever since then, people reported hearing and seeing a boy that matches Nachito's description, wandering around at night. Others have seen mysterious balloons just hovering above the gravestones as if carried by a small child. Many people who hear this story actually go to visit Nachito's grave. Some hope they won't see the signs of him at night, but reports of his sightings continue to this day. Moving on to number 6 now, we have the Cadejo. This is a supernatural character from southern Mexican folklore. There are two types of this creature, the white and black Cadejo. They are dog-like creatures. The white one is said to be good, accompanying people home late at night. The black Cadejo is fear as an evil spirit. It does exactly the opposite. It tries to kill people walking alone at night. If the person survives the attack, it's because they are an idiot, apparently. Quite often, a person is saved from the attack by the white Cadejo. The two will battle it out until the good Cadejo wins.
wind. It's a sight to behold. While they are dog like creatures, they're often described as being much, much bigger than dogs. Some reports say they can be as big as cows. They have burning red eyes and goat's hooves. They lurk in graveyards and dark alleys, waiting for their victims to pass by. They have a distinct smell of concentrated urine and burning sulfur, if you can imagine that. People say they move in a very demonic nature with short, jerky movements. One thing to remember about the Kadeho is that its gaze can freeze you in place, at which point you can be easily attacked by the evil one. Next up at number 5 now we have La Mala Hora. This name translates to the evil hour or the evil one, either is a fitting description for this being. In parts of Mexico it's believed to be a wicked spirit or evil demon that wanders country roads after midnight, waiting to attack anyone who walks alone. It waits at crossroads, hoping for a lost traveller to pass by. For the people who have seen it, they fear the evil one more than the actual devil. It first appears as a large black lump swirling through the night air and changing shape. It shape shifts quickly, getting bigger or smaller at will. People say it resembles a ghostly black shroud or a large black cotton ball. Nobody wants to see it though, for to do so will drive a person to insanity. The demon will try to hypnotize and paralyze people before attacking them. When it does, it rushes forward as a thick black smog, enveloping and suffocating them. The next morning, locals will find them dead at the crossroads and they'll know who is to blame. Next up in the before now, we have the Princess of Bufa. This story comes from the Caro de la Bufa, an area of forested hills and rocky cliffs on the southeast side of Guanajuato. There, locals say an enchanted princess lives at the peak of the mountain. They say that on Holy Thursdays for centuries, she will emerge from the mountaintop to call out for a handsome and valiant man to rescue her by carrying her down to the altar in the nearby town. Once there, she will become a human and the town will be restored to its former glory as a booming mining town. However, as with many similar stories, there is always a catch. They say the man who rescues the princess must not be so stunned by her beauty that he cannot complete the journey. He must carry her calmly in his arms all of the way. He cannot look back or lose his step, especially when he starts hearing strange noises behind him. If he does turn around or stumble, the princess will turn into a vicious, hideous serpent and will devour him whole. People say this happens every year because the town has still not met its former glory. Will the snake princess claim victims like this forever? Moving on to number 3 now, we have the mannequin. In a store window in the city of Chihuahua, there stands a bridal mannequin that has become famous in the paranormal community. It's been there since 1930, and at first glance, it doesn't look so creepy, but wait till you hear this. Soon after it was placed there, locals noticed the mannequin bore an uncanny resemblance to the daughter of the woman who owned the store, Pascuala Esperaza. A rumor spread that this mannequin was actually the embalmed body of the daughter who had recently died on her wedding day after being bitten by a black widow spider. Of course, the mother denied all of this, but the legend took hold. People were convinced it was the body of the daughter. The resemblance and just how lifelike it looked were just too perfect. Sonia Bursiaga was a woman who worked in the store. She had to change the outfit twice a week and was quoted as saying, every time I go near Pasquala, my hands break out in a sweat. Her hands are very realistic and she even has varicose veins on her legs. I believe she is a real person. Well, I thought that sounded a little bit ridiculous until I saw the close up of her hands. Now I'm not so sure. I'm only sure that I'm never going anywhere near her. Moving on to number two now guys, we have the island of dolls. If you head just south of Mexico City, you can find an island that attracts tourists from all over the world. The whole thing is covered in creepy dolls of every shape and size. There is a famous story as to why. It's said that a girl was found drowned in mysterious circumstances many years ago on the island. Her body was found by a man called Don Julian Santana Barrera. Shortly after, he saw a floating doll nearby. He hung it to a tree as a sign of respect and as a way of helping her into the next life. However, it didn't seem to work. Don Julian was apparently haunted by the spirit of the girl. He began hanging more dolls in an attempt to please her restless spirit. Then he realized what he had done and it was already far too late. He believed the dolls themselves were now possessed by the spirits of dead girls from all over the world. His friends say that he went mad, as if driven by an unseen force to continue what he started. After 50 years of doll hanging, Don Julian was found dead, drowned in the same area where the girl had died. Now locals believe that his spirit has joined the others on the island. People visit to honor him, the girl, and the spirits of the others. However, most people don't stay too long and almost 
almost nobody would spend a night on the island of dolls. And finally at number one now we have the seventh son. This story comes from a remote area near Toledo. In the 19th century there was a boy who lived in a village. His name was Federico. He was the seventh son in his family. In fact his father was also the seventh son in his family. Locals believe that because of this he was endowed with dark occult powers. They say he had second sight and the ability to predict the future. Even more he had a natural gift for healing, curing any one of their ailment with just a touch of his hand. Although he was kind, quiet and shy, the other kids hated him because they feared him. Overall the village wanted nothing to do with him. And so one night the village elders held a meeting to discuss what should be done about him. They voted to kill him and then destroy his body. That was said to be the only way the village could be kept safe from the dark forces he channeled. It led him to an abandoned shack in the woods. When his back was turned they pounced on him and bound him up. In a satanic ritual they stripped him, hung him from the roof and then lowered him into a vat of boiling oil. It didn't stop there though. He was still alive and screaming in pain and so they gouged out his eyes and hacked his body to bits. The parts were then put in a wooden barrel and dumped into the river. With that they were satisfied. The next day some villagers went to visit one of the elders. They knocked on his door but got no reply. As soon as they entered they stopped. There was the elder dead on the floor. His eyeballs were on his chest. His head had been crushed beyond all recognition. His eyes and feet had also been chopped off. On the ground in front of the body there was a message written in his blood. Innocent blood has been spilt. Now the guilty must die. After that day all the elders who were responsible for the boy's death began to die one by one. One. Their bodies always found in hideous ways. When the last one died, there was another message written in blood. It read, Now I have been avenged. The guilty have paid their debt. Mm -hmm.